Good morning and welcome to this morning service for this uh, first Sunday of Advent which is uh, November the 7th and uh, we begin with a response. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. And so now we have the opportunity to do just that, to remember our sins before God and to confess. A moment of quiet. And then we pray together. Lord God, we have sinned against you, we have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so may the Lord enrich you with his grace and nourish you with his blessing. The Lord defend you in trouble and keep you from all evil. The Lord accept your prayers and absolve you from your offences for the sake of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. And so now the special prayer for this week, the collect. Almighty God, as your kingdom dawns, turn us from the darkness of sin to the light of holiness, that we may ready be ready to meet you in our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is from Matthew, chapter 24, 
verses 1 to 21. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one in the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for the pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequalled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equalled again. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our canticle this morning is Psalm 100. It's a responsive version, and we're going to join together. Oh, be joyful in the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is gracious. His steadfast love is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be for ever. Amen. Now we're going to return to the theme of that reading as we continue our series of sermons in different aspects of Jesus and his ministry. And Jan is going to preach for us. Hi everyone, we're continuing our series on the life and ministry of Jesus, looking at different aspects of his life and ministry. So we've been thinking about Jesus as storyteller, Jesus as miracle worker, Jesus as controversialist, Jesus as exorcist. Today we're thinking of Jesus as prophet. But before we begin, let's just have a think about, well, what do we mean by a prophet? There are uh, over 130 named prophets in uh, scripture, uh, prophets and prophetesses. They weren't all men, they were women as well. Uh, and um, what did they do? Well, basically, they were uh, God's mouthpiece. They were men and women who were able to speak the words of God to individuals, to the nation, and to the world. And to help us really understand what that was like, what kind of people they were, uh, we can go back to 1 Samuel, where we, uh, rather helpfully, I think, are told that in the old days, okay, so this is written, this is written in the old days, but uh, uh, in 1 Samuel, it's got, in, in former times, prophets were known as seers. And I think that really helps us to understand what a prophet is. A prophet is, 
is a person who is able to see things through God's eyes, who's able to see reality as God sees it. In other words, it's a divine worldview that they proclaim rather than a human worldview, a cultural worldview. It's God's worldview. And um, I think a really nice way of illustrating this is uh, by using the image that is behind me. You might be wondering, why is there a dandelion behind the vicar's head today? Well, ha have a look at the image. I'll get out of the way. What do you see? Well, I I I've already given it away. It is in indeed a dandelion. And like all dandelions, it's yellow. It's a yellow dandelion, Jan. What's the big deal? Well, what if I told you that actually this yellow dandelion isn't yellow at all? That is just your perception. That's your perception. That's what your eye is telling you. But of course, as I'm sure many of you will know, if you put a dandelion and you filter out all the normal sunlight and just have UV light, you get a very different image. There we go. This is what you get with a filter that just takes out all the natural light and when you shine a UV light on a dandelion. And of course, this is nearer to what a bee sees because bees are able uh, uh, to see with uh, uh, the UV light of the spectrum, the color spectrum. And of course, where's the nectar? Why is a dandelion a different color in the middle? Well, it's to get the bee to go to the right spot. It's a bullseye. So do you still believe that dandelions are yellow? On one level, you're absolutely right. But from a, a UV light perspective, or from a bee's perspective, you couldn't be more wrong. It's clearly not yellow. And that is what the role of a prophet is all about. Things that we see and that we recognize can look very different when you view them through the eyes of God and through the view of his cosmic purposes for all time. Shouldn't surprise us, but that's the reality of it. And so and again and again and again, the prophets act as, as spiritual mirrors, I suppose, as another way of thinking of them. People who are able to, to show the people of God how God sees them, what they're like, what they're really like, and are able to look at the everyday issues of the day under that eternal perspective. Now, it won't surprise you, therefore, to think that Jesus was a prophet, because that's exactly what he did. And he said, didn't he, that he only spoke of the things uh, that he heard the Father say. He only, he gave testimony to what he knew, what he had seen of the Father, what he had heard of the Father. It was only his, his Father's words that were repeated. In other words, part of his ministry was about giving God's perspective on everything on human life itself. And so again and again, Jesus takes an everyday issue, an everyday matter, and it suddenly becomes so much greater because he's able to see things and to join things together, to amalgamate them together with a heavenly perspective. So Jesus in his last week on earth has caused a huge commotion by entering Jerusalem on sitting on the back of a donkey. And he knew exactly what he was doing then. It was to fulfill prophecies. Here he was having uh, so often kind of tried to keep his kingship hush hush, his messiahship hush hush and quiet. Often you'll say, don't, don't tell them that I'm the messiah, okay? Tell them what God's done for you, but don't, don't speak to people about, uh, the, you know, don't tell people that I'm the messiah. Finally, in his last week on earth, he makes this very bold statement as he comes in on a donkey, 
it's uh, uh, everyone's preparing for Passover. So Jerusalem is absolutely full of worshippers who've come from all over the world to be there for Passover. So the population of Jerusalem would literally quintuple, you know, during the celebration of Passover. It would have been absolutely, you know, all the streets would have been full, full, full of people. And it's into this kind of febrile, festive atmosphere that Jesus comes in on a donkey with the crowds shouting Hosanna and he's basically saying, I'm the king. You can imagine what the temple authorities thought about it. And you can imagine what they thought about him then going into the temple and turning over the tables of the money changers. You know, literally driving them all out. This man full of zeal, who up to now has been talking about things like loving your neighbour as yourself. And there he is, suddenly driving the money changers out. This is a house of prayer. It's my father's house. It's a house of prayer. This is not a place to fleece tourists, okay, which is effectively what the money changers were doing. And the people who were hardest hit, of course, were always the poor. So it's, this is the atmosphere, this is the situation for our reading today. And as they leave the temple, the disciples uh, are, you know, make quite a sort of a banal, very nice, benign comment to Jesus. So an everyday observation. What's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. But Jesus is a prophet. He's going to use a banal, everyday thing, everyday statement to talk about matters that tr far transcend the initial subject. So they say, isn't the temple amazing? Look at it, how beautiful it is, how wonderfully decorated it is. That's the beginning of chapter 24, which we had read. And, well, you can understand them. I mean, the temple, which is Herod's temple, the second temple, has been there for over 500 years. It's a huge building. You know, this is the ancient Near East 2,000 years ago. And for 2,000 years ago, this is a mighty, mighty edifice. It would have been really impressive. And, and Herod has uh, been doing it up. It's been refurbished, reordered uh, to meet the demands of uh, the first century Jerusalem. He's enlarged the temple. He's built greater walls and, you know, no expense has been spared and, and the whole place has been beautified. So it would have been a really stunning building. And of course, every Jew, all Jews would have been tremendously proud of this building because it was for them the house of God. It was where God's Shekinah glory uh, resided. It was for them the epicenter of their uh, national, racial, and religious identity. And Jesus responds with a typical tax of a prophet. He goes, it's all gonna be destroyed. No stone is going to be left unturned. It's all going to be destroyed. Can you imagine what the disciples felt? So they walk off and with this extraordinary statement of Jesus rattling around in their heads and they come to the Mount of Olives and they can't bear it. And they ask him two questions. And this is very important that it is indeed two questions. It says the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? That's question one. When will the temple be destroyed? And, question two, what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? I think from that verse, I suspect that for the disciples, the two were conflated. They probably couldn't imagine the temple being destroyed on any other day than the same day that Jesus returned. But Jesus answers two questions. When is the temple going to be destroyed? And when 
is the end of days? When is, when is the day of judgment? When does Jesus come back in all his glory? And he gives them two different answers. It's not the one answer that covers them both. There are two different answers. But because he's speaking as a prophet, he is kind of going in and out of the two answers. He touches on both. And as all prophets do, you start off talking about a particular historical event, but within a line or two, you're talking about matters and issues that affect the whole of the cosmos for the whole of time. That is just how it is. That's how a prophet speaks. That's how a prophet sees things, because a prophet sees God in everything and sees God's purposes in everything, in, in the little detail of life as well as the, the, the big stuff. So Jesus answers them, see that no one leads you astray. So already he's kind of answering the question, but in a, a slightly oblique way. See that no one leads you astray. This is what's important. Don't be led astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they'll lead many and you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. I wonder what your response is when you, you read the news and you read about global warming or you read about uh, uh, the Chinese military build-up, or you read about uh, um, uh, the Taliban, or you read about some of the issues of the drug wars in Central America and South America. Uh, how do you respond to these things? Jesus says to his disciples, this is normal. This is to be expected. We live in a really crazy, dangerous world. We really do. But for you as my disciples, he says, see that you are not alarmed. This must take place because the end is not yet. We haven't got to the good bit yet. Jesus hasn't returned with all the fullness of his kingdom. So these things will happen. And he says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There are going to be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. So he says, the world is like a woman in labor. It's not nice, it's not pleasant. There's a lot of pain, there's groaning and there's shouting, but the birth will come. New life will come. But this is part of uh, uh, the way these things are going. It's just the beginning. And he goes on, he says to his disciples, They'll deliver you up to tribulation, put you to death, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many are going to fall away and people are going to betray one another and hate one another. And you can read all about this in, in, in the stories of Acts and in the letters uh, of, of, of the apostles. People do betray one another and let one another down. And, of course, there's lots of teaching about false prophets, people who claim to have God's perspective on things, but in fact don't. He says... Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. All these things will lead to two kinds of responses. One response to the trials and tribulations of life will be that people will harden their hearts. The pain and the injustice will be too much. And instead of Continuing in Jesus' footsteps and obeying his commands, people will just go down the worldly way of things and they'll harden their hearts. But, Jesus says, the one who endures to the end, in other words, the one who obeys his commands right to the end, who continues to do what? Well, it's two basic things, isn't it? The one who continues to love God and love his neighbour as him or herself, they will be saved, says Jesus. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now, if we skip to verse 34, which we haven't read this morning, Jesus says, then the end will come. And he says, truly, I say, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. Um, this generation, what's he referring to? This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Well, Jesus 
says in verse 36 concerning that day, that final day and hour, that no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. No one knows when the end will come. Jesus says, I don't know when the end will come. And it's so interesting that so many Christians through the ages have been trying to work out when the end will come. When Jesus says, I don't know, what hope have they got? Seriously. So these other things that Jesus is talking about in the rest of chapter 24 earlier on are not about the end of things. He's talking as a prophet about the destruction of the temple, which will, of course, take place in AD 70. Jesus' words do come about 37 years later. So he says, verse 15, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So Matthew says, let the reader understand. In other words, if you want to understand what Jesus is saying here, you need to go and read the book of Daniel. And when you go and read the book of Daniel, you read these extraordinary prophecies about kingdoms. There are four different kingdoms. And Jesus is saying, there's going to be the, 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 the desolation of abomination. The, 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 uh, the temple is going to be desecrated. And it's exactly, of course, what happened. The Romans came and they used the altar, which was meant for sacrifices to the Jewish god Yahweh. They used to make sacrifices to their gods as a show of power, as a show of our, we won because our god's greater than their god. The temple is desecrated and then they ran away with all the loot. They looted the whole building and they destroyed. They raised the building to nothing. This is what Jesus is talking about. And so he says, let the one who's on the housetop not go down to take what's in his house. Let the one who's in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days, when you see these things happen, run away. It's going to be terrible. And Jesus, as all the prophets, did you know the prophets, they're all poets. Even Jonah, which is mostly written in prose, still has a poem in the middle of it. But pretty much all the other writings other than Jonah, are poetry. Why poetry? Well, because the prophets are speaking of things that are beyond our everyday, rational, materialistic kind of view of things. They transcend what we see and touch and hear and feel. They're talking about things on a, on a you know, a cosmic sized screen. They're talking about things to do with eternity and blending all that with the everyday experience of what it means to be a human being. And so it shouldn't surprise us that the prophets are indeed artists, they're poets. Because just saying, well, you know, life's going to be quite tough for a while uh, and then I'll come back, it'll be OK, it just wouldn't do it. They want to grab people's attention. They want to say, wake up. The dandelion is not yellow. You've got it wrong. Wake up. It's, it's magenta. <laughs> I'm not a poet, so I can't do it. But if a poet were to describe this flower, how would they describe it? They wouldn't do what I'm doing, which is to say, well, it's kind of, you know, bluey white with a bit of pink in the middle. They would use literally flowery language. And that's what the prophets do throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. They use hyperbole, they exaggerate. And for the people of Jesus' day, this would have been normal. They would have been immersed in the prophets' writings. If you go to synagogue every week and these writings are read out week by week by week, you know, in, and this is in Hebrew, in, 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 with poetic standards, with rhymes, etc. You know, these, these images, they're, they're powerful and they stay with you and the expressions and, you, and you'd be able to sort of work out when is something being told to us in a kind of a straight, factual way and, and, and when is a prophet trying to do something more? When is a prophet trying to do the work of an artist? in drawing our attention, in helping to interpret our world.
Jesus was a prophet because he was bringing to the world the reality of God's perspective, which is so often so different to our own worldviews and our cultural assumptions about who we are and what our purpose is. His spirit goes on in the church. We are called to be a prophetic people. A people who are not only aware of the realities that Jesus was talking about, but are able to proclaim them and demonstrate them to the people around us. And my prayer is that that, that prophetic spirit will continue to thrive and grow and express itself in the church through all of us. And that when we look at some of the terrible and complex issues of today, we won't be alarmed. But we'll know that there's a greater reality and that we can trust and have confidence in a love and delight and joy and peace of God. Amen. We respond now to God's word in a responsive form of the creed. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so now we turn to a time of prayer. Let us pray. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Let us pray. Father God, forgive us. For all the times when we neglect to seek your face, forgive us. For all the times we arrogantly assume we have the answers, forgive us. For our thoughtless use of the world's resources, forgive us. For all the times we allow our greed to prioritise our own needs over those of others, forgive us. For all the times we seek to blame others for problems and fail to take responsibility for the things we can do ourselves, forgive us. Lord, unite your people in prayer, not only in and for this nation, but all the nations of the world wherever your people are found. Call us to humble ourselves and turn to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our planet and our climate. We pray for the COP26 conference in Glasgow. Pour your spirit into that place, Lord, as nations gather to work on global solutions to a global problem. We ask that you would grant them wisdom, inspiration and direction in their endeavours. Fill them with ambition and determination and a willingness to work together to achieve a common goal. But as we watch and pray with hope for world leaders to take action, let us not absolve ourselves of responsibility. 
So Lord, we ask that you would give each one of us wisdom to see what changes we can make in our own lifestyles in order to live more sustainably, to reuse and recycle where possible, to consume less and to share more. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that you would bring an end to this pandemic that continues to impact our world as we reach the grim milestone of over 5 million lives lost to coronavirus, we pray for all of those families who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are suffering economic hardship as a result of it. We pray for those who feel exhausted in the fight against it. Father, give them all the strength and resilience they need to get through these tough times. And we pray for speed in vaccine manufacture and delivery so that they can more quickly be rolled out throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our benefits at this time of change we pray for the new churches that will be joining us. May we be a blessing to them and they a blessing to us so that we can be made richer and stronger by this change. We pray that you would give wisdom and discernment to those involved in the process of finding the next incumbent for our benefice. And especially we pray for Jan and Hannah and Sophie, Toby and Max. Thank you, Lord, for this family and for all the ways they have blessed us. Pour out your spirit on them as they work over the next few months to complete their time here. Enable and equip them as they follow your calling to new challenges. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As always, Lord, we pray for those known to us who need your intervention. The bereaved, the sick, the lost and the lonely. We lift them all to you and ask for your comfort, your healing your presence and your grace. Let us take a moment to think of those that God has placed on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we thank God for our prayers and the opportunity to bring our needs before him and we sing again together now a song, O oh, Praise the Name.
final prayer. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And so now our service comes to an end and I trust that you'll uh, watch for the notices and that you'll be with us again next week. God bless you. Yeah.